Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. Hello and good morning and welcome to The Morning Show with me, Carl Smith, where we ask the question, is hope making a comeback in our schools? And um, this morning we've got some very interesting topics to uh, really mull over and discuss on this one because um, I think uh, it's fair to say this this covers just about every issue that we currently face in our schools and colleges. Hope is important because it can make the present moment less difficult to bear. If we believe that some uh, that tomorrow will be better, we can bear a hardship today. However, hardship without hope makes us feel hopeless and hopelessness is a um, a really toxic and dangerous state. Hopelessness is a terrible feeling and it destroys people. In schools there's been precious little hope over the last few years which is why there has been a rising tide of suspensions and exclusions and an exodus of staff. It's a, a classic fight or flight response to a situation where you feel trapped and helpless. Either that or people just become numb and existing, some kind of um, nothing state, a, a catatonic state. Virtually every problem in schools over the last few years has taken away our hope. Sadly, school leaders felt um, overwhelmed by the tide of negativity, while teachers felt that all the joy in doing their job had been sucked out of them. If you like, all pain and no gain. Uh, In wider society, rioting and extremism are born from hopelessness. And um, people who have been educated well enough to feel they have a good future in the society in which they live will not riot. However, schools must deal in hope. They are working with young people who have their whole lives ahead of them and all things should seem possible. Schools should be fundamentally optimistic places, looking forward, not backwards, and assuming the best and not the worst. Yet that hasn't been the case since the pandemic until now. Because now I get a strong sense that the tide may be turning um, for a variety of reasons. There is hope in our schools again, um, even if there are huge challenges ahead. It might just be that the early signs of economic recovery, uh, with inflation coming down and growth finally on the rise, are making a, a difference. It's way too early yet to improve the lives of millions of people in our country, but at least things are moving in the right direction, we would um, like to think now. Um, so. Let's start with the fully funded 5.5% pay rise that we were given over the summer. Unexpectedly generous because we've been so used to part funded um, pay awards, below inflation pay settlements, but nevertheless desperately needed. Um, It has the potential to relieve some of the most acute budget pressures in schools and help them retain and even recruit new staff. A motivated profession is possible, again, one where people feel valued and proud to work in schools. Then there's the demise of the current Ofsted regime um, and uh, some of the worst toxicity that went with it. Schools are more than happy to be accountable, of course, but Ofsted had become something of a mill stack for many schools, weighing us down dominating every step that we took. The impending end of single word judgments and the uh, fairer complaint system we're promised may not quite yet be the promised land of inspection, but it's surely better than the current situation. We can also think about a new scorecard system, which is more balanced, more nuanced and less blunt. The details are not clear yet, but it is encouraging that it has finally been accepted that labelling great swathes of schools and the profession 
as failing was rather counterproductive. Um, then there is a new curriculum review that we're promised. Some might dread the thought of more change, um, particularly in the area of curriculum where we've seen so many changes and a new set of rules. But surely we couldn't go on dragging every child through 10 highly academic GCSEs while guaranteeing that 30% of young people would fail every year. Surely we can do better for this forgotten third. The stark regional divides in education um, and, and the outcomes in particular at GCC cannot be good for society and reform is most certainly needed. Then there are suspensions and exclusions, which we know are up from the latest figures from last year, but there's a good chance that they may have peaked. And um, although the media have only just caught on to this topic, everyone in education has known that there's been a huge deterioration in behaviour from the moment that we returned after the sec second lockdown, after the pandemic. No one thinks that this will suddenly disappear, but because we are perhaps becoming better at managing this new world and the driving forces behind it and behind poor behaviour, um, maybe those driving forces are weakening a little. Similarly, we all know about attendance. Attendance has been pretty dreadful now for the last couple of years, but there is a new national strategy that's been launched this new term. Schools are becoming more experienced at working with the most intractable cases of poor attendance. And there is at least a chance, therefore, that attendance will improve a little this year. And we could go on. We could look at the SEND system, which um, in the view of many, many people is, is broken, but at least it's acknowledged that it's broken, widely acknowledged, and schools are not being blamed now by everybody for failing SEND students. Instead, there's a, there's a recognition that um, national reform is, is needed. And then there's parents who we know are very challenging or can be very challenging indeed, but are extremely important. Um, but again, at least the problem has been called out. It's widely understood. And there are proposals to end the tidal wave of vexatious complaints that have worn staff morale down to the bone. Everywhere, there is a distant prospect of light at the end of the tunnel, but at least there is that prospect. So today I'm talking about hope in schools with an experienced and highly successful um, vice principal, Neil Rawls, and asking him if he agrees that the tide is turning. So good morning, Neil. How are you? Uh, good morning, Carl. Thank you for uh, having me on your uh, inaugural show. Oh, no, that's, uh, that's, that's my pleasure. So hope in schools. Is it making a comeback? Um, I think so. If someone's going to be asking me about my uh, stages of optimism at the moment, I'd say it's a solid six and a half, well, maybe six and a half as it's Friday. Um, and uh, certainly that will be a massive upturn <laughs> from this time uh, 12 months ago. That's right. It depends on what you ask people, isn't it? I mean, at the start of term, you know, we're all likely to feel a little bit more optimistic or you'd hope so. Although the last few years, it's not felt so much like that. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe in the last week of the autumn term, when the, the evenings are dark and so on, that six and a half will turn into something a little lower. Oh, I think that will all depend on, uh, on I think, really what, what comes out in terms of the wider agenda in the coming months. And I think if you were going to ask me where the six and a half comes from or mm. why, why it isn't any higher than that, I think it's, uh, you know, there there is definitely a change of narrative regarding education mm. uh, since the um, since the election. And... Uh, we know which which is very very welcome, and it'll be in, and and there's there's clearly a lot of language which is encouraging that there's a sense of mm. a, an understanding of some of the issues mm. that have been faced by the sector, um, but the language also is open to interpretation. It'll be interesting to see mm. in the coming months how how those things start to firm up into uh, proposals. I think we've all become very cynical, um, which of course you know, hopelessness leads to cynicism. You don't believe that things will change because they haven't changed for so long. Um, but do you think it's just warm words and sound bites or do you think there's something more to it than that? I think there's probably a broader recognition around quite a, uh, quite a lot of the um, sort of social policy debate at the moment that things aren't working, haven't been working for quite a long time. And unless... Um, and, and blaming those sectors for things not working um, is not going to be a route to 
sorting those problems out. Yeah. And I, I, it does strike me that when uh, when we have a prime minister that talks about you know a, a society that or a country that feels feels broken or feels like it's just not working properly, that does indicate that there is yeah yeah a sense that. Um, that there's a determination to make some inroads into fixing it, and I so, think for that, he will, mm. you know, the the uh, current administration will will get a lot of uh, a lot of goodwill towards yeah. helping them make that be so. No one expects perfection, no. uh, but at least a, a movement in a direction which is more positive about the public sector mm. um, and how and a more positive in the way it's promoted to the public. Yeah, um, I think is to be welcomed. Yeah, yeah. No, it, I mean, it is about the way it's communicated, of course. Um, when the pay award came through, um, I was on holiday, like a lot of teachers, I suppose. And um, my first thought was, well, yeah, OK, they've accepted the pay body recommendation. That's surely what is meant to happen. But is it going to be fully funded? But then I've uh, checked with my business manager um, and she assures me that, in fact, it does seem like it's fully funded. Um, all seems a bit too good to be true, really. Or is that just me being overly cynical, do you think? I think it was a very clear message that there was a determination to, not uh, virtue signal, in very much a way, practically say things are moving, things are changing. There seemed like there was a determination to get past the public sector disputes or potential disputes that would come mm. um, very quickly to, again, start to shift that narrative from, you know, uh, a country where in, in key sectors, education, health, transport, mm. um, people couldn't rely on the service or the service was being disrupted, you know, due to due to concerns mm. about whether it be pay or conditions, mm. which by and large, the public seemed to be quite sympathetic towards those mm. sectors, sympathetic mm. towards, you know, junior doctors, for example, quite mm. sympathetic towards um, teachers mm. um, in a way that I think was maybe perhaps surprising and mm. therefore a, a sense that let's get this resolved. And also then, I think apart from um, getting hopefully goodwill by sending a very clear message, mm. it's also a way of saying if there is pain ahead, if there are things that are uncomfortable further ahead, mm. well, Hey, you know, we, we've we've set things off in this direction. Mm. We we want you to kind of support and work with us, and I think that's yeah. um, and that does set a tone which I think many in the profession can get behind. And we need to have a you know a solid memory back to this yeah. because, of course, the key thing with the the fully funding is while it's great that the recommendations from the board was accepted, and mm. I think everyone in the sector appreciates that. I think there's a, a widespread understanding as to what's happened in terms of wages over the last you know, 14 years or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the key thing was that it was fully funded, which is mm -hmm. also sending a message that we take the budget yeah. uh, constraints that are within schools seriously yeah. and yeah. we recognise your pain and we recognise we can't keep asking you to do more right. while, um, you know, while increasing... So-called productivity gains all yeah, the time that, yeah. what, that just simply weren't there. Yeah, yeah, that, that actually there is no further road in that. Mm. that we've got to take it seriously. And I think for, for school leaders, that was a massive, a massive boost. Um, and, yeah. and, and, and hopefully it's a move towards getting past this sort of ludicrous situation where school leaders are going into a summer break mm. uh, with a budget that is an if buts and maybes budget yeah. uh, and, and and having to staff curriculums and make decisions six months mm. in advance without any certainty as to what that budget might look like that can't be an, an efficient way of going forward i mean that i mean the very fact that you don't get the information or in the last few years we haven't got the information until the middle of the summer holiday when everybody is um not at work and therefore unable to discuss the implications of it people do the best they can but the reality is it's um you know going to be really really difficult for people to make any decisions at that stage and of course the nature of schools is such that you've already made your decisions about your, your staffing um you know there's a there's a normal deadline for resignations of the end of may and after that point people simply can't in most cases move schools and, uh, and make decisions about that so 
to make those um, announcements in the middle of the summer holiday is profoundly unhelpful. I'm sure, sure, you know, we all agree on that one. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Get set for the year ahead with the Bloomsbury Education Back to School Sale. Save 30% on all Bloomsbury Education books until 30th September. From the very best in research-led practice to trusted advice on inclusivity, behaviour and curriculum design, we've got something for everyone. Visit bloomsbury.com forward slash B2S sale to shop now and save 30%. Bloomsbury Education, books for every step of your teaching journey. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Media outlets across England, Wales and Northern Ireland have covered GCSE and other Level 2 results in detail. Many stories highlighted the fact that Year 11 pupils receiving results this summer started Year 7 in September 2019 but were in lockdown before the first year of secondary school had ended, with the BBC describing the cohort as unique. Many stories focused on the GCSE pass rate, which has fallen for a third year running, back in line with 2019 levels. The drop was steepest in Northern Ireland, followed by Wales. In England, the plan was to bring grades back in line last year, but they remained a little higher. The regional divide continues to grow in England. London continues to be the highest performing region with 72.5% of entries marked at grade 4 or above, compared to the 63.1% in the West Midlands. The gap is up from 87 last year to 9.4 percentage points. It seems the pre-Covid North-South divide is continuing. Four out of five regions in the North and Midlands had a lower pass rate this year than in 2019 but in every region in the South it has risen. Many have commented that long-term disadvantages within some regions are to blame. MPs warned last year that it could take a decade for the gap between disadvantaged pupils and others to narrow to pre-pandemic levels. Resits are also set to rise for both English language and maths. This is because the pass rate is slightly worse but the 16-year-old population has grown since the pandemic, so more places on courses to resit will be needed. Colleges have previously said they had increased class sizes due to population growth and grade boundary changes, but will now need to prepare for even more. This has prompted some to question whether the compulsory resit approach is still appropriate. Full details of the results analysis can be found on the BBC, TES and other education news websites. In Australia, the right to disconnect is coming into force. It gives employees the power to not respond to out-of-hours contact from their employer without suffering consequences. This has prompted some to consider the impact this could have on schools. While some legitimate out-of-hours activities have to take place, residential trips, visits and sport, etc., teacher unions have argued that staff should not be permanently on call. They have particularly focused on parent and student contact with teachers, especially via email, and the expected response times, which should be in place in order to protect work-life balance. The news from Australia has prompted fresh debate on social media regarding workload for teachers in many countries, use of emails, and the recruitment and retention crisis in the UK. The Guardian focuses on the story of a group of trainee female doctors from Afghanistan who have travelled to Edinburgh to complete their medical degrees after the Taliban forced them to quit. The 19 women arrived in the UK last week after a three-year campaign by the parents of Linda Norgrove, the kidnapped Scottish charity worker who was killed during a rescue attempt by US Special Forces in 2010. A foundation set up by her parents worked with UK and Scottish officials to arrange safe passage and student visas. 
they have been given places at four medical schools after Scottish ministers changed the law to treat them as home students eligible for free tuition. One of the women arriving said, Our journey here will be long, eight or nine years. I think during this time many alterations and changes will come to Afghanistan. I am hopeful the situation won't remain the same. Finally, a primary school in Orkney has welcomed a new, unusual intake of pupils. According to the story on the BBC News website, the new class is made up entirely of boys. The rare occurrence is a first for the P1 class teachers, but the situation doesn't seem to bother the boys themselves, with one of the 18 saying the class was good without girls. The school is making sure that the boys will still have the opportunity to interact with girls outside the classroom but that the boys' only class was really special and something they're going to remember forever. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. Welcome to Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you for listening. Do you think it's going to make a difference, though? Do you think... Do you think... The, I mean, we've seen the ads on the TV now are coming out again, you know. Um, do you think that the change in teacher pay is, is going to start to improve what is a dire recruitment situation at the moment. It's the worst. I think that people have, you know, known for, well, living in living memory, I should mm. think. Do you think it's going to make that much of a difference? I think the, the thing that interests me, and I think it's an interesting conversation, is why teaching is so unattractive. And why, how, why and, why, it and why has it become unattractive? Yeah, um, because you know I, I, I frequently see the, the you know the, the percentage of teachers who are contemplating leaving the profession. Mm. Uh, I, I've never been one of those who's no. contemplated leaving the profession. No. But, you know, um, you know, despite the ups and downs, and and that's probably uh, not to the benefit of the profession no. um, <laughs> well, or, or many of the students and colleagues I'm that, sure I, that's not true. that I work with, um, you know, yeah, so, yeah. Um, who wish I would, uh, yes, retire to that coffee shop in Cornwall. Yeah. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but, but in practice, I think it, there is probably a serious, a serious question around that is, mm. is what, what are the genuine barriers? I mean, I think that there is the perceptions about, about, income has been mm -hmm. has been one aspect to it mm -hmm. but i think that's only one aspect and there's been the whole issue of workload yeah and workload i know has come up again in, mm -hmm. in looking forwards and and, mm -hmm. and contemplating new curriculum which i guess we'll get on to in, in due course and i'm not entirely sure anyone's really got to the bottom no. of what that workload no. issue really actually constitutes mm -hmm. and how much to be frank is the cause of external factors, mm. whether it be, you know, Ofsted or, mm. or expectations, mm. um, or how much of it is actually self-generated internally. Mm -hmm. In other words, to what extent do schools and, and, and multi-academy trust by their own practices mm. unwittingly mm. make a situation less attractive yeah, for people that's coming into? That's an interesting yeah. question, yeah. And I think that, and then beyond that, I think there are, you know, areas around as people have moved towards more flexible working, mm -hmm. um, expectations of working from home, expectations of working say, in more yeah. flexible ways. Is it simply that the, the model, I, I mean, mm -hmm. I know that uh, we were talking about the four day week and people mm -hmm. being able to work longer in certain Just talk of it being made professions, a, a, yeah. a right, a, a yeah. standard right. Um, mm. to work four days. I, yeah. I have no idea how yeah. that would work in education. And, and, and that, you know, they have the caveat of where it's not practically possible. And I guess that, mm. that's where I education would, that would fit in. Out doors, um, and so, so, and I think there are issues around, you know, the length, you know, quite frankly, the way the holidays fit in and the mm. holiday patterns and whether, mm. it act, whether actually we have a, a system of schooling or the structuring of schooling over the course of the, of a year yeah. that actually fits with the world that we are moving into or are in yeah. rather than one that is very you know would resemble um you know back to the 1950s yeah i mean i'd be very interested to know what other listeners reflections on that was in terms of is is, is the current model of school simply um not fit for 
the 21st century to coin the, the, the phrase you know um I, I, do we need to look at different different types of models the trouble is that there's a cost mm-hmm. you know the reason why a five-day model um you know a sort of broadly speaking nine to four model works or has worked is is because it's affordable um the moment you get into the areas of the kind of flexibility that people see in you know some other organizations there that that would add a significant cost Mm -hmm. to delivering education and and you know uh, is society um prepared are decision makers prepared to put the level of investment in that would facilitate that and and I'm, i'm not completely convinced that they are Mm. if i'm being blunt about it um i don't know i mean i for me it does ask questions about what people want out of work and i think that both you and i um you know we're a similar age we won't we won't divulge the age but uh let's just let's just say we're over 20 and um the the for us the expectation when we were growing up was that that, that most people's work was um a a reasonably regular pattern anyway um and and you would have a day and then you would have weekends and so forth um and and for us that was the way we thought of things but obviously increasingly now people work from home and people have more flexible arrangements and perhaps that's permeated into the mindset of um you know potential teachers and potential people working in education and they're uh less enthusiastic about buying into the 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 sort of more rigid structures that schools um currently follow but i'm not i'm not entirely sure i buy into that narrative i'm i i think possibly the world of flexibility has been certain to a certain extent imposed on people sometimes by employers who are shall we say, looking to make efficiency savings himself, to use the phrase, um, both in its euphemistic sense, but also in its actual sense. Um, but also because of circumstances, events that have that have arisen. So whether people actively would want that way of life or whether they've found themselves having to accept that way of life, um, that, that that's a diff- different matter. But so you think that possibly when it comes to um you know teacher pay uh that that that's part of the answer but it's not the whole answer and the whole perception of workload is is very much unresolved yet i think so i think it's an element of the perception of workload and i think then Mm. i would imagine the perception of how how much status teaching is regarded to have yeah both in terms of how it can be perceived by young people and mm-hmm. people we will get on to i should imagine mm. the the rising challenging behaviors that yeah. has been in the last Absolutely, few yeah. years and also as you mentioned in the introduction the perception of parents and the community mm. uh, and how much value is put on put on the teacher and and mm. teaching so i think there probably is something around mm. that um, yeah. i mean it's an in, it's an interesting question and i think it would be one that um, and i've certainly not seen recent research on what graduates perceptions of teaching are and what the barriers are that make it no. make it particularly not an attractive mm. route for them mm. you know um i would imagine but it's certainly not money isn't certainly isn't everything i don't think no it's not everything no no um i think it might be more of an issue actually in retaining people um in terms of uh you know, people feeling that as they go through their career, they're making calculations. Mm -hmm. And certainly when they get to late 20s, early 30s, and typically people Mm -hmm. are looking to settle down, maybe start a family. I think then sometimes people make calculations. And I think also people make calculations when they get towards the later years of their career um, about whether they is something that they, they want to continue to do or whether there are other options that may or may not earn the same money but which nevertheless might give them a better quality of life they, mm-hmm. they, they will they will they will weigh those things up but but i'm with you neil in that i think the drivers are principally through the the, the high, high stakes accountability regime that we've 
um, had imposed upon us. And, and, and schools are sometimes blamed for developing internal systems which put huge amounts of additional burden on teachers. Um, but I think that the reason why they do that is because they're living, they're existing in a, in a culture of fear. And school leaders are, are, are desperately concerned that if they don't do those things, they either won't get the performance that, that is expected of them or they won't be able to provide evidence of the performance that is expected of them. And consequently, they feel obliged to almost overcompensate by doing everything, um, trying to measure everything that moves, ask for you know, everything to be bolted down and, 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 and sort of scripted almost because of the, of the fear of letting go and, and giving people the autonomy that, that they actually want. Um, I'm not convinced that if those things were toned down a lot you know the drivers the offset was was done in a different way or, or, or you know inspection was presented in an altogether different way um uh, if then schools would themselves naturally change their culture in response I, I feel that's probably what would happen um so i think really the root of the problem it, for me is the way that schools were thrown into um you know this sort of market philosophy this dog eat dog world where they were expected to compete with one another all the time in this very sort of crude um statistics driven manner and it meant that schools then over the last 20 30 years have developed to you know systems to try to respond to that and cope with that but of course it's created this toxicity now which makes people think well i don't want to do this but the intrinsic job of teaching and working in schools, I don't believe, resources notwithstanding, that people wouldn't continue to enjoy that and get great satisfaction out of that um, and meaning out of that. I think there's still plenty of people who would do if there weren't all those other things wrapped up with it. So I'm, I, you know, I'm quite optimistic, really. I think we've just got to we've just got to fix the model around it. And what what bothers me a little bit. Neil, is that quite often when, you know, I'm asked this question and, and I've had civil servants and people on surveys and what have you, and what they're looking for are quick fixes. They're looking for, um, ah, well, if we say that teachers don't have to do this or we, we introduce flexible work, that'll solve it all. I don't think it will. I don't think any of those things will. I think the only thing that will solve it is when the high stakes accountability regime that surrounds school is reformed, so it becomes more reasonable, more collaborative, more partnership based. So people in schools work, people who are working in schools feel like they can get on with the job of teaching and working with young people and are not constantly in a um, quite brutal regime of being measured, weighed, um, and uh, in sometimes thrown out on a on 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 their ear for for things that are only partly in their control. If you know what I mean. So I think that's it's more that, and that comes from government principally. That that comes from the national level. Can we move on to um, well, let's move on to uh, Ofsted just for a moment mm -hmm. because we've touched on those things quite a bit, and I, I think that would be a, um, a a suitable place to move. So. Um, what do you make of this ending of the uh, single word judgments? What's your what's your view? Well, is that the answer? It's part of the answer. Mm. Um, I think it's it's curiosity, isn't it? I mean, I, I was looking at some of the uh, sort of feedback from parents, mm. uh, and uh, it was quite interesting that um, how you know I think it was just four in ten parents read an Ofsted report yeah everybody else just looks at the single word judgment yeah um everybody who's been through an Ofsted inspection recognizes that you know it, how subjective it really is absolutely yeah. um and yeah. having lived through good ones and and mm. more challenging ones mm. um in both cases you felt that um, torches have been shone into certain places mm. to illuminate certain aspects that fitted a certain narrative yeah which were not a in truth mm. a balanced view either positively you know mm. or, or in a more challenging way and and i and i think that the, that was always the danger with those one word judgments that you can realize that they need to come on to, to come down to an, an on balance mm. approach mm. uh but that on balance approach um has 
you know, so much subjectivity feeding into it. And I think that's mm. that's what that's what's really concerned the profession. Yeah. Um, is that it was a lot on interpretation mm-hmm. rather than what was necessarily actually yeah. actually occurring. Yeah. You know, it, it, it makes VAR look very, very reliable. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, by comparison. Absolutely, and, yeah. Um, on the other hand, VAR is much quicker feedback, actually, than yeah, Ofsted, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, I do, you know, so I do think anything that moves it towards a more nuanced approach. Now, mm. obviously, in terms of parents, I mean, it, it gives a nice quick snapshot. It's yeah. nice and easy. Um, I can understand that. Um, I, but I think when you're, when you're within the institution, what you realise is that, you know, on, on such a a model that it will take years. You live with that judgment for years. And even, and even introducing a new system is going to come with its own challenges it because is, yeah. they'll have schools that are sat with judgments mm. for maybe another five years mm. as as a new system comes Well, comes, it's an interesting into question, that, because it's occurred to me, I've wondered whether when the new, when, when the single word judgments are scrapped, whether schools that have single word judgments from the past will continue to use them in their mm-hmm. advertising and marketing presumably forevermore as though it's fixed in a tablet of stone or whether the government and Ofsted actually say no you you actually can't do that you mustn't mm-hmm. do that you must um obviously as soon as you're inspected you must make sure that people just look at the mm-hmm. the report or whatever the format is and you don't keep referring back to a single word judgment that's been scrapped a long time ago and, and shouldn't you know well, I mean, I, it again touches on. I think sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, in the way that that um, as you know, as institutions, people will throw out that. Um, as I drive around now, and you can see yeah. you see those uh, you know the the posters and the, oh, and the, the banners God, going yeah. up on the on the roundabouts with recruitment coming up, Definitely. and it's you know we're outstanding, we're good, yeah. and it's you know on the one hand we don't we recognise how fallible these judgments are. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we also cling on to them in a way that gives them greater sort of status than as a profession. We could choose to view them in a different way ourselves. Yeah, you see, I mean, in some ways, I, I, I'm i kind of caught in two minds on this one. I, I'd be interested to know what, what you know, listeners think um, about promoting your Ofsted outcome. I mean, obviously, you'd promote it with your own parents. You're going to tell your own parents and hopefully celebrate that, you know, the, the positives. Um, but... I think on the one hand, it's certainly true that it isn't very helpful when schools are, you know, um, over promoting their Ofsted grade um, and by implication, therefore, saying, you know, we're better than everybody else. But the problem is that we are pitched into a deliberately competitive um, landscape. So, So we're in a marketplace which encourages schools to compete with one another for for admissions and um their reputation depends upon it so colleagues um know that if if they don't you know sing sing loud and clear their own virtues then um you know they won't necessarily get get admissions in and they'll get problems that that, that flow from that so and money obviously then is affected by that as well so I'm sort of in two minds, really. I, I, I generally, it doesn't sit well with me for people saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we're great, we are outstanding." Well, you know, you're lots of things, and I'm sure you do them very well. But you're lots of things, um, and that doesn't mean the school down the road doesn't also have good things as well. Schools are more complex, aren't they, than just a single word judgment? And it reduces, well, it creates an illusion that school is something that it isn't. It also creates an illusion that there is a real level playing field in terms of resources going into institutions. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is behind, of course, whether you look at the regional divides, which are not just in GCSE grades, but also in offset grading, but also the, the divides between types of schools. A grammar school is far more likely to get an outstanding judgment than a comprehensive school. Um, a single sex girls school is more likely, I think, I'm right in saying to get an outstanding judgment than a single sex boys school, which is less likely than an ordinary comprehensive school, if, if you will. It's not ordinary, it's just comprehensive. But um, simply because the circumstances mean that they are immediately either at a natural advantage or a natural disadvantage. 
and no matter how much you know uh, inspectors try to compensate for that in their mind how do you compensate for it how do you if you see everybody behaving well how do you then adjust your judgment for the fact that you'd expect in certain circumstances everybody to behave pretty well whereas in another one they're not and how do you adjust that and, and that's that's an almost impossible task to do to ask somebody to do so i've got sympathy with inspectors in that sense that they would struggle to do that but the reality is parents will take those judgments as absolutes won't they mm. this is good this isn't not this is reflective of the community that the school is operating in and these are the circumstances and actually they're doing a great job with that they won't necessarily be able to factor that in or care mm. to factor it in. it won't matter to them no no I, I, indeed and i think that's 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 going to be the interesting thing about moving to a school car system <laughs> Um, is that do you end up with a system that satisfies nobody, depending on... Yeah, um, there is that. And it's going to depend on what the criteria is going to be on that. So I think, to go back to the original question, moving away from single word judgments has got to be a positive thing mm. and a positive thing for um, school leaders and mm. I think making school leadership more attractive to people wishing to take on headships. Yeah. Um, because I think it just it takes that bluntness mm. um, out of it and all the perceptions that come with it. What follows will be will be interesting, but the devil will certainly be in the in the detail. I think so. I, I think I would agree with all of that, 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 that there is a danger in the scorecard system, that it's death by a thousand cuts rather than one, mm -hmm. you know, that you end up chasing 10 different indicators, performance indicators and almost failing, almost feeling like that, that you'd have to succeed on all of them mm -hmm. to feel like you're succeeding. Um, and uh, so it can, it, it, it does have the potential to create more anxiety, which is unnecessary and unproductive anxiety. So there is, there is that. I think it's got, yeah, the yeah. devil is in the detail with this, isn't it? Yeah. And I do, I think, fully agree as, as probably we all would, that local parents do have the right to have some value to judgment on how their local school is performing. Um, it, they need information, yeah. yeah. And I they think, do they, you know, that, that's, that is more than reasonable. Yeah, but the question is, you know, how that is presented in a way that's mm. both useful for the audience, but also, you know, clear and fair. Mm. Uh, and I think that's probably an area that is a struggle wherever this comes in with, mm. with the public mm. sector. So when you know the local GP is being rated, um, for example, yeah. um, again, the, the, the nuance is absolutely key. Yeah, it it is to, to a, a grown up debate. I think. And I think the trouble is with treating public services like businesses that people have expectations which are unreasonable for those public services to meet. Because if you're, a, literally, mm. to draw the analogy with a doctor, if you're a doctor in an area with, shall we say, a, a, an ageing population, you are by definition going to have people, a larger number of people, who are suffering from chronic illnesses and, mm. and sadly, in some cases, dying of them. Does that mean you're a worse doctor? Of course not. Um, you may well be a better doctor than a doctor in, um, shall we say, a, 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 an area where there's a richer and, and, and younger demographic. But, you know, it, it, that wouldn't necessarily show in the statistics. And I think, I think that's why a much more subtle story has to be told. Um, so people have a better understanding of what it is that they're working with. I mean, the other thing is, I mean... You know there are there are there are plenty of countries in the world where it is perfectly normal in fact unusual for a parent not to send their child to the local school whereas in our country certainly in some parts of the country it's this big mind for this competitive minefield i mean do you think that the assumption should be as you would lo your local doctor you just go to your local school and then everybody's invested in the effort to make that school the best it can be. Yeah, I think that there, 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 there's a lot of merit because I think that by the, by the nature of changing that uh, relationship, changing that relationship with your local community, it makes everybody more accountable and answerable to meeting that local community's needs in a, in a meaningful way. But it takes away from parents, doesn't it? The, the power of choice. They don't have that choice then. They, they sort of 
it would be very difficult for them to send the child to somewhere else. Indeed, but how much is that choice and illusion anyway? That's right. Based on whether you can buy a house in the particular particular yeah. area or not. That's right. Um, and and what range of schools are available to you in your you know particular vicinity? You know, well, that, some, that, that's, some people yeah. may notionally have a choice between mm. um, the grammar school and and an alternative, yeah. um, or between you know schools mm. with similar similar gradings mm. or very widely different of their gradings and perceptions around them. Yeah. Um, it, that, that whole area does, does strike me as being, it's, gonna, it, it's out of the box. It will take a long time to get it back into the box. It will. Uh, and it hints into the kind of multi-academy trusts and mm-hmm. how they work and, and the, the really the, the fragmented system that's been allowed to evolve. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So I don't think there are any quick fixes around that. No, at all. I think there's going to be a whole system change, hasn't mm-hmm. it, before we get to that stage. Um, so we've said that notwithstanding all the qualifications, pay is generally a good story. And there is at least room for some optimism that recruitment might improve mm-hmm. um, and motivation. But we've, we've similarly said there is at least something to celebrate in the change in Ofsted. Um the forthcoming change, uh, whilst we still know that, that there's a lot more to do. Um, so moving on to other areas, uh, what about behaviour for a minute there? Because obviously that gets an awful lot of attention and probably the single most important thing on a day-to-day basis if you're a teacher in a school is is how well are the, the, the children and the young people that you teach behaving. Mm. Um, general consensus is that behaviour has... T- taken a, a, a quite a dip since the pandemic. I mean, first of all, um, w- what's your thoughts on whether that that's actually real? Has has it definitely changed since the pandemic? Do you think for all students? I think that's the uh, that would be the question I would ask. Um, I would say for the vast majority, there hasn't really been that significant a shift in their attitudes mm. and approaches. Um, but I think the the size of the minority of a minority students that have become more challenging, they're more extremely challenging, um, is certainly clear to see on the ground yep. where I am that 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 number has in- increased, mm-hmm. and therefore their influence has increased. Mm-hmm. And certainly, sort of probably anecdotally on a local level, it's also improving over time and that is really noticeable as well yes so so i'm quite conscious that when you you look at the suspension figures exclusion figures that were certainly in the press i think over the weekend yeah you are looking back 18 months at those figures you are and what i what it wouldn't surprise me to see is that if we see an improving trend when we see those figures for the 23 24 academic year i i I would like to think so and that that trend will will continue Mm. um so you know uh, what is concerning is 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 the types of things but also it it is i mean there are some good news stories in here so i did notice that while um exclude permanent exclusions uh, obviously have gone up yeah uh, but they haven't noticeably gone up for is um issues to do with uh bullying they've actually gone down um i didn't i didn't know that yeah no. um Issues to do with with, with race, mm. um, no real change. Good. Issues to do Good. with with sexuality and gender, right? No change. Okay. At all. So when you look at when we look at those, it basically comes down to persistent disruptive behaviour. Yeah. That's mm. the one closely followed by mm. physical assaults mm. on students, mm. student to student. Then a similar rise in physical assaults on staff, mm-hmm. quite often at primary level. Yeah, um, yeah, which is really shocking, yeah. of course. And then um, the most the most general area of improvement is that is that, that persistent you know, refusal to comply. Yeah. Now, there, there are so many factors that will play into that, of mm. which the pandemic is one, but mm. there will be others. Mm. You know, I think you've got to look at this as being the, you know, this is the first generation that have smartphone technology Absolutely. and all of the things that have come with that where mm-hmm. we can't really assess what the impact is and how significant mm-hmm. or insignificant. And it's a real area of debate. Um, there's been the whole area of, of impacts of, of austerity and, mm. and one thing and the other. Absolutely. In terms of education, I think this is also, we're now hitting the story of 
the consequences of the curriculum changes and the GCSE mm-hmm. changes. Well, that also has a big factor, a big were, part to play. Yeah. That were made, what, 2014? Yeah. We're now a decade mm-hmm. into those changes. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get on to that in a minute, yeah. And and when you look at students that are underachieving and you look at students that are being excluded mm. um, and you start to see, not surprisingly, a significant overlap. In other words, I would question is, is part of this, the pandemic, mm-hmm. un allowing a gap, if you like, in mm. for these other things to sort of flood through, uh, which is basically the system of education we've got does not suit mm. too many of our young people. No. I mean, the problem is with that, again, we get back to resources because it's all very well for, for people to be saying, as, as they often do, well, you know, schools mm. aren't meeting the needs of this group of child or that mm-hmm. group of child. But the answers are there in terms of there are people who have experience of saying, well, if we do this, that or the other, we can meet that need, certainly in most cases. But that requires a significant extra injection of resources, which simply isn't there. And frankly, I mean, this is an optimistic show and and we're looking forward to many things which are getting better. I don't see any prospect of being there anytime soon. You know, I mean, if if your class size starts to drop to 10 or 12 Mm. and you know, you have a lot more coaching and a lot closer relationships with young people and with their um, with their families. Well, you know, we're in, we're in a different model of education altogether. Mm. But that would pretty much double the education budget. And I don't see any appetite for that in government in the near future. Any any colour of government, um, no matter how sympathetic to education. So yeah. are, are we simply having to accept, be honest and say, look, there are needs mm-hmm. that we would like to to meet but we can't we don't have those resources and we're not going to have them so we can't do that yeah yeah i mean i was i was looking at the <laughs> obviously the curriculum assessment reviews coming through uh, and i'm just going to take the the words out if you don't mind which are, no, which are being used uh, so so the curriculum going forward so we're looking at 2026 see yeah. this yeah it's going to be balanced ambitious mm. um, excellent um, relevant mm-hmm. flexible inclusive meaningful mm. rigorous and high value great um well that's that sort of thing, which then. is which is a wonderful world word <laughs> soup mm. um and in truth it's one thing coming up with those with yeah. those messages <laughs> and, you know and they are they are laudable aims mm. but i don't think you would have got a different set of words from any other no government since no. you know the second no. world war saying that's what they want out of the education yeah. system that's right um, yeah what i do think is probably the key is the you know if if there is a real heart at heart Mm. intention to move towards uh, an industrial policy Mm. for the UK that's what and and a sense and a sense of real planning Mm. as to where high value jobs might be where skills Mm. shortages are where where young people can get to I think Mm. anything that connects what's going on inside Mm. the school Mm. to a young person to truly where those roads might take them Mm. beyond Mm. i think the more that that can be explicitly linked Mm. in meaningful ways the better so for example Mm. i mean i'm sure i'll say this controversially Mm. that something like gcse english language which will be a barrier for many students going on to Mm. post-16 courses of their choice Mm. and they'll have you know they'll have missed out on that grade does that English language qualification mm. truly check what employers think it does, mm. which is the competency of that young person's a- literacy? Absolutely, it doesn't. Yeah. And, uh. and we know that those students then, you know, and I know obviously the law is changing around mm. the amount of curriculum time is going to be spent on that. Mm. We also know that, you know, there is a shortage of staff to be able to deliver that mm. curriculum. Mm. They fail if, you know, if they don't mm. get past that again in November, mm. it gets more and more of a distant possibility. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, for students who may feel disengaged with education, mm, mm. I think a sense that I'm never going to be able to get to this, yeah. that that failure is baked into the mm. system, it is a fairly easy way mm. of a low cost but effective way of maybe yeah. changing the, the, the sort of way mm. we can promote education to young mm. people rather than forcing them to try and get over this hurdle, which yeah. many of them know that they're not going to be able to. No, I mean, I think there's a danger in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. There are 
um, groups of young people for whom the current curriculum arrangements were a step forward. They were mm-hmm. they were good. Yeah. Um, they they uh, you know were relevant and they 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 thrive from having a more academic curriculum. Mm-hmm. But there are, you know, to use the phrase, the forgotten third at least. Mm-hmm. Um, and a number of other young people who aren't forgotten in the mm. sense of Jesus E grades, but nevertheless want to move in a different direction, who are looking more for a, a I mean, vocational is a loaded term, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and that's yeah, the yeah, trouble absolutely. with it. But 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 they're looking for something which is, is more likely to engage them that that that, that will have training involved in it. I suppose that's what T levels have been yeah. all about, and, yeah. and, and and so on. And um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would welcome certainly in, in the secondary curriculum um, uh, uh, more options and more opportunities for young people, certainly from um, the age of, you know, year nine from 14 onwards to have uh, things which are more um, in their eyes relevant to their training for their, um, you know, their economic role in society rather than just uh pure in the academic sense so they feel a level of motivation and they feel a level of i suppose interest and relevance in that in the way they think of it to to what they're studying i think that would help yeah mm. certainly do you think though that 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 um that that will solve all the i mean is, is, is that it just change the curriculum and behavior will improve or or are the i mean what, what do you think there's anything else schools can do to help make reduce the number of suspensions and exclusions um again i think that the, the, there's a lot said about this this phrase of sort of um of, of inclusivity and i think it is a i think there's been a certain sort of almost blame blame game mm. around mm. um the inclusivity agenda yeah. Yeah. um this probably drifts into send as well mm. um where the assumption is that if something's going wrong it must be the fault of the institution mm. um and I think there does need to be a more of, of, of a, a collectivist approach mm. to both send and behaviour yeah. at whether it be local or regional level where mm. there is, you know, where there is a genuine access mm. um, to the real support that some of these young people mm. and their families need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a, perhaps a a narrative change from mm. the, if the school is responsible and if the school is the school's failure mm. to to ad- adapt behaviour yeah. to um, perhaps the the way this setting yeah. is set up is not necessarily appropriate. No. No. And, and again, there are, there are a lot of you know valued, I think, words around these agendas mm. coming out. Absolutely. But as we as we all know, these things cost money, and actually, mm. a lot of that. For example, maybe say external provision. For example, yeah. um, isn't there? I mean, I did notice. That I think I think I've read a statistic that out of the mm. thirty-seven, I think it was proposed free special educational needs schools mm. that have been given the go-ahead, mm. only one has actually operationally opened. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean that says it all, really, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, I think, yeah, for me, it's true that. Either we have to be honest, politicians, government have to be honest with the public and say, look, um, we, we, are, we are not prepared or we don't have the resources to fund a number of more specialist provisions to cater for children and young people who have, um, shall we say, more, more severe uh, additional needs of various sorts. So therefore, they are going to have to somehow cope in the best way that we can with with the more rigid structures that mainstream schools have to offer because they that's what they're funded to do or we say look this is what the cost is going to be and um and we're going to do it we're going to invest in that and we're actually going to build these places and we're going to make them work and to do that um there needs to be an ongoing commitment um so i think a degree of honesty about what education would look like if we really want it to work for everybody is required and um it it, it it has to have those resources to then support that otherwise we're going to be stuck in this doom loop where um 
we can never deliver what certain sections of the public think we should be delivering. And that doesn't mean that we're failing. It means that we aren't given the resources to do anything else but um, deliver what we are resourced to deliver. Um, and, and, and I think that, that it, it, but the blame game is, is not helpful because it's not the fault of, you know, the likes of you or I or the, the teachers or the education support staff or the school leaders, you know, that, that, that are listening today. It's not the fault of anybody like that. It's a simple reality that without those resources, you can't offer the kind of provisions that people's expectations um, are hoping uh, and think are necessary, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think like like most of these things, it's 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 about a focus as well. And uh, I mean, I noticed in uh, uh, I think with Guardian and Observer, both sort of led on their two education stories. One was mm-hmm. about um, behave, it's going to be the worst behaviour known yeah, to man yeah. this this yeah, year. Yeah. And then the second one was the the complete crisis in special educational needs, mm-hmm. and to a degree, while well, 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 there are things in there that that. You know, need to be taken mm. on board. Mm. I think that's necessarily particularly helpful either. No, no, no. You know, um, you know, it's so, sort of reminiscent of focusing on football hooliganism mm. rather than the ninety-five eight percent or ninety-nine no. percent of the people, you know, who attend mm. games who behave in a perfectly normal and civil civil manner. Yeah. Yeah, um, course, so yeah. I, I think again around these narratives, you know, that there are things that need addressing and sorting out, but. By reinforcing a sense of crisis, by mm. reinforcing a sense of mm. failure, I don't think that's particularly helpful. No, uh, and, but, and, and kind of misses mm. the point of the vast, you know, the vast majority of teachers and students who've actually thrived and done a really good job in the last oh, two mean, or three years in, in, in what has been trying circumstances. Yeah, yeah. And I think that does give a good foundation mm. that there is a foundation within the system mm. of, of good things happening, mm. um, and schools doing really interesting and innovative things. And and the more that that can be built upon. Mm. I think that can only be a good thing. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it also reflects a deeper confusion in society between our understanding of um, where we draw the line on, on, on individual responsibility insofar as, you know, schools are very familiar with being presented with a scenario, well, child X has done this or done that and, you know, that's poor behaviour and they must take responsibility for that if they're able to move forward. And then um, other people saying, ah, yes, but they have these needs, so therefore they aren't responsible because those needs are not things they control. And yet society expects people to have a degree of of individual responsibility. And, um, you know, in the adult world, regardless of what the cause is of the problem, um, you know, you are subject to the law, and and uh, and that's that's something that we're preparing young people for. So I think there's some real tensions there, and some some quite deep rooted um, uh, confusion. Because there is, I don't know whether whether there's any clarity from any quarter, but you know what I mean. It's it's difficult for people to um, to, to to solve that particular puzzle because yeah. you know people will feel frustrated at the same time as wanting to understand and wanting to be sympathetic. I think so, and I think a good example of that would be the, the sort of students not attending through, you know, uh, emotional mental health issues. Uh, and again, I think the 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 narrative coming out, um, well, it, you know, from from the government has been um, in terms of the kind of the, the send review um, improvement plan that's come out, which is schools need to be. I quote, particularly mindful mm. um, about students with men- who can't attend or are partially attending through mental health issues, yeah. and it, and must pr- and, and should provide additional mm. support. Mm. Without being clear as to what either of those things no. are, mean uh, closely yeah. followed by <laughs> pupils are still expected to attend regularly. Yeah, yeah. So saying, well, stating the obvious yes, without yeah, actually yeah. reconciling the two, without being clear as to. What the consequences of not attending regularly are, no. uh, and to what extent that's because whatever additional support you gave wasn't the right or wasn't no. sufficient, no. And, and I think there probably does need to be a, a sort of a, a, a seek of a sort of towards clarity on these yeah. as to where the balance yeah. of rights and responsibilities is like lie for schools and mm-hmm. students and parents. Absolutely, is hope making a, a comeback in education? What, you gave it a six and a half, Neil. What do you think? I think I think it certainly is making a comeback, mm-hmm. and that's because the narrative and the debate is starting to resonate with I think 
what what's happening within the profession and what's happening within mm. the profession over the last few years. Mm. Um, I think there is a sense that that where we are needs to move forward. Mm. Um, you sense that's an agenda from the government. Mm. You also sense, given the number of education secretaries we seem to have got through, that that Quite a few. that is always fairly indicative of <clears throat> of a lower value to which yes, education has right. uh, in terms of the ministerial portfolio. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it's always hopeful when you when you actually get a, a new administration in, mm. um, much as, 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 you know, the coalition government did with, mm. with the GOVE reforms. I mean, mm. say what you will about them, mm. at least it provide, there, was, there was an impetus and a decisive move to address what were perceived as issues that, that many people would say had certain resonances. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I think that's really interesting. And if, and if that... Mm view of education as part of more of a lifelong learning industrial mm-hmm. strategy mm-hmm. therefore maintains that education we're interested in this in the, the long haul mm-hmm. um you know you just think you need two terms now absolutely uh, because we're not going to see the changes in the next couple of you no. know couple of years and rightfully but, you know i mean the one thing they are talking about is consultation mm-hmm. and taking expert <laughs> advice mm-hmm. um and um looking at the evidence and mm-hmm. I think it is about time to do that. Yes. And I think then we need to coalesce probably as a country mm-hmm. um, around a long term vision as to how this might look. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. the fact that we're moving in that di- it, it seems like we're moving in that mm-hmm. direction. Mm-hmm. That is great cause for optimism. Well, that is a really optimistic way of wrapping up. I mean, I'd, I'd concur. I'd, I'd even push it to seven. I think there is a good deal of hope there. Um, and despite all the things that we know are always problems, I think there's 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 reasons to be more cheerful in education. Well, thank you so much for listening um, to us today. I really appreciate that. This is my you know, inaugural show. Um, if you uh, think it was worth listening to, then love to hear from you again or love for you to join us again in two weeks time. Um, and uh, I hope you, you get the chance to look at some other or listen to some other Teachers Talk radio shows. Um, for example, the Friday Twilight show, five o'clock today with Claire. Um, Saturday morning break, eight o'clock in the morning with Darren. And um, uh, obviously you can download this uh, and listen to this as a podcast. Um, But for now, I'm going to wish you all a lovely weekend and a great new year in school. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.